you are welcome to this video. Thank you for, for coming back. Now, there's so many things we could be talking about today. There's increasing infections in the United States, in Europe, quite significant increases in a lot of Europe. Uh, a field hospital being built in the Czech Republic by the Czech military. Parts of the UK, Wales has been basically shut down for the next couple of weeks. But what I want to do rather than talk about these details is talk about what we could really call the, the bottom line of this pandemic, why this matters. And the reason this matters is because of the risk of death. Now, if you or I get sick for a few days or a week, then that's greatly unpleasant. It's not very nice. Um, but we've all been there before. But there's a big difference between that and, uh, and actually dying. What is the risk of, of dying? Now, the case fatality rate tells us the number of people that die, the proportion of the people that die compared to those that are diagnosed. But of course, there's always many more people infected than diagnosed. So the infection fatality rate is the number that die for the total number that are infected. And of course, the total number that are infected is not always known. That's why this has been difficult. So rather than trying to work it out or trying to speculate, let's just go straight to the published data. And you know, I'll try and give you a bottom line on this video. I think the bottom line is um, the infection fatality rate is lower than I thought it would be. So I'm, I'm really quite pleased by the information I'm going to give you. We're still talking about a lot of people, but it's lower than I had feared, lower than many had feared lower than many had anticipated. So guarded good news, I think, on this video today. But anyway, getting straight onto the, the data. This is the infection fatality rate of COVID-19 inferred from zero prevalence data. Now, this is quite a big study. It's a collaboration between the World Health Organization and Stanford University in the States. So zero prevalence, I think we all know now, is the, uh, the proportion of people that have the antibodies to COVID-19 in their blood. So when people are infected, most people will develop antibodies. That is in the serum part of the blood. The serum is the liquid part of the blood after it's been spun down in a laboratory. That's tested for the presence of the antibodies. So zero prevalence means the amount of antibodies in the blood is what it really means. Indicating the amount of people that have been exposed with some provisos, that is what it indicates. So, um, this is estimated, uh, this study aims to estimate the infection fatality rate from zero prevalence data. So we know how many people die, that's not hard to get, we can usually get that, but it's the zero prevalence that's harder to get. And typically this is based on a particular sample size, and if that sample size is representative we can extrapolate up from that to the general population. And this can be quite an accurate way to collect data, rather right? because we can't test everyone obviously. Um, so this study, 61 studies, 74 estimates, eight preliminary national estimations as well. So a lot of data here put together by this Stanford WHO group. Zero prevalence estimates range from 0.02, hardly any people infected, to over half the population infected, depending on the area. Do read the paper for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of detail there if you wanted to spend a bit of time looking at that. And the infection fatality rates range from naught which of course is rather good, to 1.63 was the higher estimates. Now, the overall infection fatality rate, this is the uh, percentage of people that died compared to the number of people that were infected across 51 locations. The median figure, COVID-19 infection fatality rate was 0.23. So that is the headline figure, 0.23%. The median figure for all the data looked at in this study. 0.23%. So it's better, it's not as high as we had feared at one stage, that is for sure. Um, most locations probably have an infection fatality rate of less than 0.2 for most areas. 0 0.2, 0 0.2%. Now, I, I sometimes get numbers a bit wrong, like like yesterday it was 160, uh, not 600. It was a 1 in 160 of the population that's got, <laughs> that, that was infected in the particular week we were looking at, not 600. It was 1 in, six, one in 160. So 
I do sometimes get numbers a bit wrong, so sorry about that. But I th these are right now, so we've got these. So let's just make sure we've got it. Overall infection fatality rate, 0.23. Most locations, no more than 0.2% dying of those who became infected. So, in people under the age of 70, people less than 70 years, the infection fatality rates range from 0 to 0 0.31 as a high people under less than 70 years of age. And the median in that age group was low 0.05. So in the areas looked at, the median figure was 0.05 of infection fatality rate in those under the age of 70. Not as bad as we had feared. Now, um, they were very aware that the infection fatality rate varied quite a lot from area to area, country to country. And uh, we've looked at this quite a few times. So they gave, they gave uh, some examples here of why this might be the case. Factors in areas with low infection fatality rate. Younger population is the big one, but that doesn't quite explain Japan. Um, we've looked at Japan in the past. So I'm not going to go into in detail now. Don't pretend to have a simple answer to that one but it does appear to be a bit of an, an anomaly because it's got a low infection fatality rate, but a fairly elderly or a very elderly population. But generally that trend was quite closely followed. Um, previous immunity from other coronaviruses is a possibility. Genetic differences. This is talking about genetic differences in the population, but there is the possibility of genetic differences in the virus as well, although the study didn't highlight that. Uh, cultural factors like hygiene etiquette are important. Lower infectious load may lead to less severe disease. So for in Japan, if mask wearing is very common, people that are infected are infected with a lower infectious dose, what we call a lower inoculum. Maybe that's got a milder, uh, a milder course of illness and therefore the infection fatality rate will be lower. That's, that's possible. Um, other own unknown factors, <laughs> certainly covering themselves here. I mean, for example, we've looked at a few things. We've looked at tuberculosis vaccination as a possible preventative effect. We've look, looked at um, parasitic infections being a possible protective effect. People who have gastrointestinal worms, for example, may be more prone to severe disease and death. Malaria, we've looked at that as well. So there's a few other possibilities there that might be protecting people or indeed increasing their risk. But just to bring this to life, now if you look up the study, there's lots and lots of examples there, but I've just picked out a few to illustrate. Um, and this is the this is the list I've, I've come up with to, to illustrate uh, what they're talking about here. This is from the paper. So this is the country or the area this is the infection fatality rate overall for everyone. And this is the infection fatality rate in those under the age of 70. Under the age of 70. This is the way they chose to divide the data. Now, they could have done it over the age of 65 or whatever, but they chose to do it uh, under the age of 70. So infection fatality rate overall in Argentina, 0 0.13. Under the age of 70, 0 0.09 dying. Brazil, overall 0.27. Under the age of 70, um, that should be 0.09, my apologies. 0.09. Always the, 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 uh, the infection fatality rate under the age of 70 is lower <clears throat> than the overall infection rate, fairly obviously. Now, data for the whole of Canada not available, but British Columbia, uh, the overall infection fatality rate is 0 0.59. Under the age of 70, 0 0.08. Denmark, again, under the age of 70, much lower. France, overall 0 0.3, 0 0.03, 10 times less under the age of 70. Uh, Italy, Netherlands, uh, this is, there was a few studies done in New York. This is one of them. Um, this showed a relatively high under the age of 70 infection fatality rate in, in, in this one study in New York. But there were other studies in New York as well. South Florida, there was a study done 0.25 infection fatality rate overall, 0.08 under the age of 70. Uh, Louisiana, 
0 0.3, 0 0.1. Uh, this is the Bay Area, California Bay Area, 0 0.12, 0 0.03 under the age of 70. Uh, Georgia, 0 0.44 versus 0 0.15, and Missouri, 0 0.2 versus 0 0.5. So um, we could have given many more examples, but we see in every case the under 70s are dramatically less likely to die than the uh, than the population average. So there we go. That was that study. Um, we have to qualify. If you look in the study, then, you know, some of this is based on old data. Some of it's based on new data. What they did was they just put together the best we've got. And that was published. When was that published? I think it was quite recently. That was published on the 14th of October. We did say that published on the 14th of October. So put together quite recently, but not all the data was as up to date as that. In fact, some of the data was quite old. But it's the best the team could find at the time. Now, um, many studies illustrate the effect of age. We'll just look at one. Uh, assessing the age specificity of infection fatality rates for COVID-19. Uh, Meta-analysis, looking at many studies. Uh, implications. This one's from published on the 6th of October. Um, now, this one, um, this was the Australian study. This was the University of... Uh, mostly based in, in Wollongong. Um, now, I'm pretty sure Wollongong is just south of Sydney on the east coast. My brother used to work there, actually, from time to time. So uh, I've never been there, but I've, I know of it. Um, yeah, so there's a team there has been following this, collecting global data. And uh, the papers are very tightly written, I must say. Um, when you read the papers, you think, oh, yeah, this is a good quality report. That's why I'm using it. Um, Right, uh, so infection fatality rate under the age of 55, children and young adults very low. The team don't actually specify it. Children, teenagers, young adults, very low infection fatality rate. Not zero, not by any means, but, but very low. The element of risk is so, so much less. They don't even give figures for it. They start to give figures at the age of 55 because it's all based on hard data. For a 55-year-old developing COVID-19, contracting COVID-19 infection, their chance of death is 0.4%. At the age of 65, the chance of dying is 1.4%. This is based on many uh, international aggregates. At the age of 75, it is 4.6%, and at the age of 85, it's 15%. So we see this huge increase with increasing age. As we know, but this gives the, the data. Exponential relationship between age and infection fatality rate for COVID-19. So this dramatic increase with age, very low below the age of lower age groups up here. So, but the figure's not actually given. Um, now, um, Different. This is interesting. This is interesting. Now the team, the team looked. This is quite clever. The, the, this team looked at the death rates and they looked at the demographics, and we'll look at some later on of, of the populations. And they came to this conclusion. Quite a powerful conclusion. Differences in the age structure of populations explain about ninety percent of the geographical variations in infection fatality rate. Interesting. So we know that there's different fatality rates in different countries, of course, in different areas. The team are saying 90% of that is explicable in terms of uh, the age profile of the population. In other words, these are the factors that we looked at here. These factors that determine low uh, infection fatality rate. All of these other factors. Younger population accounts for 90%. All of these others and whatever else we think of the parasites, whatever it is, the malaria, the TB vaccine, all of these others are only accounting for 10% of the difference. The vast majority is explicable by the age demographic and the age profile of the population. And we'll be looking at some specific examples that before we finish, so don't, don't, don't uh, stick around. It, it is very interesting um, looking at what we call the population pyramids of different uh, areas. Now, um, the implication here, 
Consequently, public health measures to mitigate infections in older adults could substantially decrease total deaths. They basically seem to be advocating a guarding type strategy. Now, before we look at the population profiles, again, I, I want to keep this as evidence based as possible. So I'm going to look at one more study. Um, yeah, yeah, ba yeah, one, one more study. So s stick with it if you can. Um, now, this study is a very complete um, data set from Iceland. Not a huge population, but, but very good quality data collected from a lot of the population that represents all of the population. So pretty good quality study from Iceland. That's why I picked this one. Uh, look it up for yourself. New England Journal of Medicine, reputable peer reviewed source. So they measured antibodies in 1,215 people diagnosed uh, or quarantine, uh, uh, diagnosed with quantitative, sorry, a polymerase chain reaction. Right, let's say what this means. So they measured the antibodies in 1,215 people who were officially diagnosed. And the, in these people, they measured the amount of the virus. It was quantitative. It was the polymerase chain reaction, which measures for the viral um, RNA, the quantitative polymerase chain reaction. And assay means to uh, estimate the level of or to study. So in other words, it's just a long way of saying these people were officially diagnosed with the gold standard PCR test. They measured antibodies in 4,222 uh, people. Um, 4,222 people who have been quarantined have been exposed to SARS coronavirus 2. So in other words, they had these people that were officially diagnosed. These people that were quarantined because they thought they'd been in contact. And then they also measured the antibodies in another 23,000 to act as controls. So they had three groups. Um, those who were diagnosed with the disease those who were quarantined because they may have been exposed and those who were not exposed as far as anyone knew. And what they did in all these three groups was measure the antibodies. They did that in all of these three groups. So what did they find? Well, in people that had been diagnosed, um, they found that 1,107 a thousand one thousand one hundred and seven people of the 1,215, 1, so that's of this group here, so 1,107 of the 1,215 who were tested, 91% were zero positive. Now that's interesting um, that they're talking about a zero conversion rate of 91%. Of course, that, me that leaves 9% or so of people who don't develop antibodies. And remember, these were people who have been officially diagnosed with quantitative PCR antigen testing. 91.1% developed antibodies. Interesting in itself. And of course, this tells us that the antibody data um, is not going to be completely accurate because about 9% of people don't develop antibodies. But it's probably the best we've got at the moment. Uh, antibodies increased during the two months after diagnosis, so quite a long time. So they're talking about 60 days. Remained on a plateau for the remainder of the study, which was four months so the antibodies here in this Icelandic study seem to be lasting longer than other studies would indicate. Um, interesting, don't quite know why that is, but the antibodies seem to be lasting longer there. Now, I think it's worth saying that the antibodies are not the only determinant of immunity. Of course, we know as well as antibodies in the blood, there's antibodies in the uh, mucous membranes. And we know there's all these other um, responses like the um, the natural killer cells that can become specialized and the uh, the B and T lymphocytes that can become specialized as well um, with, with, with the phenomena of immu immunological memory but they're harder to measure whereas the antibodies are quite easy to measure. Right so in the quarantined people 2.3% uh, were zero positive so in other words a proportion of those 2% or so had become uh, infected. Therefore, it was worthwhile quarantining them, wasn't it? Um, now, I I've said 2% or so quite deliberately there because um, of the people that were quarantined and were exposed, some of them would not have developed antibodies because we know only about 91% of people are 
development, developing antibodies in the Icelandic data. In people not known to have been exposed, still 0.3 tested. So, so there was some um, hidden community spread there as well. Now, what conclusions did they draw from this? We estimate that 0.9 of Icelanders were infected with SARS coronavirus 2. So Iceland did a very good job of containing what we might call the first wave. It's an island, of course, which helps. Um, but they're able to give this, looking at all the antibody data and the antigen data, they're able to calculate that less than 1% had been infected. And the infection fatality rate was 0.3. 0 0.3. Just under a third of 1%. 0.3%. Roughly the same as the UK, we believe. Roughly the same as the UK. Data we've looked at in previous videos. Um, just a couple other things from that study. Uh, we also estimate that 56% of all Icelanders had been diagnosed with quantities. So of the people that were infected, they caught most of them. So in other words, Iceland had perhaps the world's most extensive per capita testing system. They picked up 56% of people who were infected. Other countries, it's not that high. So Iceland did very well on testing. 14% uh, of infections that occurred in quarantine persons had not been tested overall in the island. And 30% of infections that occurred in persons not known to have been exposed. So that was the total infection makeup of Iceland, which was other... That's just other additional information. It's kind of off the topic of the main video today of infection fatality rate. Now their conclusion, um, antiviral antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2 did not decline four months after diagnosis, longer than other studies, interesting. Risk of death 0.3 and 44% of infected persons with SARS coronavirus 2 in Iceland were not diagnosed with qPCR, quantitative preliminary chain reaction. They were diagnosed from the antibodies. So this is the key thing I want to look at. 0 0.03 infection fatality rate. Knowing that the risk of death increases so dramatically with increasing age. Therefore what becomes relevant to look at now is the population profile in demographic terms of various areas and countries. And that's what we want to do now. So this is what we call the population pyramid. Now, I suspect quite a few of you are familiar with these already. But for those of you that aren't, um, what we have here is this is the percentage of the population. So that's naught, two, four, six, eight percentage of the population. And here, these lines represent the number of people at particular ages. So naught to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 24, increasing age as we go up on that scale there. So for example, this side's female, this side's male. So we can see that of the population here, we've got 3% of the population is female in the age 0 to 4. So that's the population pyramid. And what we see is that younger people here, um, it appears that in Iceland, people have got a good chance for get, getting to older age. So the walls are kind of straight. That's the thing to look at here. The walls here are kind of straight. Um, people are surviving into different age groups. But then you, the older that you are, the more likely you are to die. So we find that once you get to these older age groups, the population left alive becomes less and less and less and less and less. And actually in Iceland, look, there's no one older, older than 100. Interesting. Um, zero percent. So we, we normally see this sort of drop off with old age. And this is the typical pattern that we get in Western countries. Now, the reason I'm stressing this is any country with a similar shaped population pyramid to Iceland may go on to have a similar infection fatality rate. Because according to the uh, Australian data, age demographic accounts for over 90% or 90%, was it 90%? It was about 90%, wasn't it, of, of the risk of death. So let's look at the United States now and remind ourselves of Iceland. That was Iceland, 0.3% infection fatality rate. Pretty similar shape 
in the United States. Looks a bit like the Empire State Building, doesn't it? But a pretty similar, pretty similar shape. So again, younger people in America have got a reasonable chance of getting older, but then the older you are, you start dying off. Actually, that's got the United States over 100 as 0% as, as well, which I know is not true. So that's just a, a simplification of the data. But you get the idea. People are dying here much more after the age of 60, more after the age of 70, more over the age of 80. So that's the profile in the United States. Does that mean we could expect about a 0.3 overall percentage infection fatality rate? <clears throat> the same as Iceland? Could well, if 90% of its uh, fatality is affected by that. The United Kingdom, fairly similar group. You can see there's been a reduced uh, birth rate in the UK for a bit of a period of time there. Um, because there's more people in this middle bit. Okay, but similar shape. Now, just bear in mind that shape and let's compare that to Kenya. I mean, wow, what a striking difference. UK, Kenya. So what we see is in Kenya, people are dying in the younger age groups at much higher rates. And that gives this real <clears throat> pyramid type shape. I mean, these are, I mean, I've, I've, I've shown these to students for, for 20, 30 years, but it's just, it's so striking, isn't it? I mean, look at that. I mean, that's the UK and that's Kenya. Higher birth rate, of course, but you know, also older people, pe people dying off from, you know, age 19 here you know it's um which of course is tragic niger um even more pronounced pyramid just to give another african country um and these people are largely being inf killed by infectious diseases of course and poor living conditions um learn a lot from a country by the cambodia a country i've worked myself um what we see is um, up to the edge of about 44, 40, fairly high population, then quite low here. So why, why is it there's so many people in the 40 to 40, so few people in the 40 to 44 age group in, in Cambodia? Why are these figures low, <clears throat> these figures high? High birth rate, obviously, but if you remember your history, um, and... Uh, I've, I've known and worked with many people who've lived through this history, suffered through this history. We had the whole uh, Vietnam era um, and the takeover with um, the Khmer Rouge and the, uh, the genocide that, that followed. And of course, we can still see the effects of that genocide as that generation works its way up the pyramid. The, huge numbers of people that were killed uh, both in the war, civil war, uh, but mostly by the atrocities committed by the Khmer Rouge. So um, just that striking difference there. So you would expect, given that there's less older people in Kenya with COVID-19 and more older people in the United States with COVID-19 to die. It is that simple based on population pyramids looks like that's accounting for 90 percent of the difference so there we go um the overall figure was 0.27 developed countries looking like nearer the icelandic figure of 0.3 and that's based on as good a data as i could work out and preparing this over the past sort of 24 hour period that's up to date data as we head into the second wave, as we're calling it now really, in Europe and the United States, can we expect similar figures? Well, the scientific officers are saying that the increase in deaths and hospitalizations are baked into the increased cases as we've looked at over the past few days. <clears throat> so yes, this is gonna happen. But what people are worried about is that people will be sick 
who can't access hospital facilities if there's a lot of people sick all at once and that would increase the infection fatality rate which is a worry which is why <coughs> excuse me which is why we're taking these current uh, precautions to reduce the spread of the pandemic okay so um there we go that was a data based as i could make it thank you for watching as always and uh yeah nothing else to say really thank you for watching that's i think i've said what i wanted to say <laughs>